morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Flynn, and I'm the City Council President. Viewers can watch the Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash city-council-tv. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in, in the audience to please silence your phones and electronic devices at this time. <coughs> Thank you. Roll call. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the road roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum, please? Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Baker. Here. Councillor Bach. Present. Councillor Brayton. Present. Councillor Edwards. Present. Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Present. Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Flynn. Here. Councillor Lara. Councillor Louis Jen. Present. Councillor Mejia. Here. Councillor Murphy. Present. And Councillor Worrell. A quorum is present. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. Mr. Clerk, will you please add Council Lara as well? Yes. Um, Councilor Kenzie Block will be introducing our clergy for today. Um, Council yes. Block will be introducing Patha Bishwa and Anja Bishwa as well today's clergy. Great, thank you so much, President Flynn. Um, Partha and Anjan Biswas are both Hindu spiritual leaders at Northeastern University, um, and I'm very grateful to have them here today with us, uh, and especially excited to also have their uh, daughters, Radha and Vishakha, here with us as well, um, to lead us in a blessing and meditation. Um, I'll just uh, note for the council, Partha's founded meditation clubs in various universities over the last 13 years to share his knowledge of how to live scriptural principles in contemporary settings. And Anjum has also been visiting many universities over the last 13 years um, and working with students. Uh, and uh, she takes special interest in bringing the messages of ancient scriptures alive through stories, drama, puppetry, art, and music. Um, and the whole family shares a common enthusiasm and passion for um, bringing Hindu spirituality to life. Um, and uh, I'm very proud, you know, I think we have uh, many uh, practitioners of Hinduism throughout the city of Boston, but many of the temples uh, are outside of the precincts of Boston. Um, but I am proud to have one in um, my district in Commonwealth Avenue, and then these very strong um, uh, Hindu spiritual chaplaincies at both Northeastern and uh, Boston University. And so we're thrilled to have the whole Biswas family with us. And I want to first uh, invite up Partha to say a few words, and then they'll be sharing a musical meditation with the council. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor, for the introduction. Um, I'll start with a very simple prayer. Om Asatoma Sad Gamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya So the eternal quest of all human beings is to move from ephemeral to eternal, from illusion to um, a state of illumination and from death to deathlessness. So the Eastern classic the Bhagavad Gita, which is a very well-known wisdom text from India, gives us a three-part simple formula of how we can achieve this goal. I like to put it as the three R's. The first R represents to recognize, the second R stands for reviving, and the third R stands for receiving. So first of all, we have to recognize that everything and everyone come from God and therefore they have an inviolable eternal connection with God. So as a part and parcel of God, we can very easily revive our connection, which is very natural. Our natural connection with God, we can rekindle the, the dormant love of God within our heart by taking the sacred chants, the names of God, 
and also by being an instrument of compassion in the hands of God while we are engaged in various human humanitarian activities. And this is going to enable us to receive the illumination in the core of our heart and that will uh, give us a platform for lasting peace and happiness. So sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramaya, sarve bhadrani pashyantu, ma kashchit dukkha bhag bhavet. Let there be happiness all around. Let everyone become disease free and let there be no suffering. And in this way, we can invite um, peace and love and joy within the human society. So finally, I would like to invite all of you to enter into a musical meditation, into what is known as the, one of the greatest mantras for peace, that's called the Hare Krishna mantra. By chanting these, these mantras, we can very, efficaciously um, tap into the illumination inside the heart. And so at this moment, maybe we can invite our uh, players just so that we can invite peace and joy into our heart.
at this time. Please stand if you are able to and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Block, for bringing such a wonderful family here to open up our prayer. Thank you. Mr. Cork, please add Council Arroyo as present. We're on to approval of the minutes. At this time, I'd like to call on uh, Council Block for a presentation uh, for a special guest. Council Block. Thank you so much, Councillor Flynn. Um, uh, and I want to thank again uh, the Biswas family for joining us. It was such a delight, um, and we really, really appreciate it as a way to open the meeting. Um, I'm up here again uh, because uh, I'm going to be presenting a, a resolution today uh, to recognize the work of Greg Gaylor. Greg, I'd love to invite you to come forward. And mom, if you want to join us, feel free. Um, uh, so while Greg's coming up, I'll just say um, I'm very happy to present this resolution honoring his work. He's recently bid farewell to the Boston Preservation Alliance um, as he's assumed leadership of the Association for Preservation Technology International. Um, and uh, Greg's been a fierce advocate for historic preservation as the executive director of the um, Preservation Alliance. I first got to know him advocating for the Community Preservation Act in 2016. He was a key part of that coalition and mobilizing historic preservation forces in favor of that. And uh, and amazingly, you know, passing the CPA actually gave us funds for the first time directly from the city for historic preservation purposes. Um, and he's also played a vital role in establishing the Legacy Fund for Boston, which is focused on how we make sure there's funding for, for historic preservation available across all of the city's neighborhoods and not just in a handful of well-endowed um, uh, historical monuments. And so uh, I've, I'm really going to miss him. We've partnered a lot on the Commemoration Commission um, on the question, uh, working with Lydia Edwards last uh, cycle around how to tweak our landmarks. Um, statute at the state level. Uh, so I know Greg's going to keep being an incredible advocate for historic preservation and a trusted community partner. Um, but as he's moving on from the Preservation Alliance after nine years, um, I just wanted to take this moment to congratulate him and wish him well. So um, I will just read the, uh, I won't read all the where as is, um, but there are many of them. Uh, and I'll just say now, therefore, be it resolved that the Boston City Council thanks Greg Gaylor for his contributions to historic preservation in the Boston area, congratulates him on his new leadership role, and wishes him well in his future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I invite Greg to just say a brief word. I'll be very brief. I just want to say I'm humbled and honored to have played a small part in a long tradition of preserving historic resources here in Boston. Um, and encourage the council to continue to support these efforts. And also to remember that historic preservation and something I worked actively on, the history of the city is everyone's history. It's a broad history and perhaps in the past we haven't done as good a job on that as we should and that's something that I know my successors will continue to do. And also remember that historic preservation is environmentally friendly, it's job creating, it's affordable housing friendly. It's a very important and valuable tool and so in integral to Boston. And I'm proud and humbled, and thank you for the recognition. Thank you so much. Um, and, and I and I do I do just want to note that we have been joined um, by Greg's mom, who I I grew up in the Dorchester and Mattapan Jewish community of many decades ago, and is a living part of Boston's history. And so we're very grateful to have her here with us today. Um, and I think with that, Mr. President, I would just uh, I would ask if we could take like a quick photo. Of course. Could my colleagues please join us for a for a photo.
Thank you. Now on to the first order of business, which is the approval of the minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting as presented. All of those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you, the minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from Her Honor, the Mayor. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0346. Docket number 0346, message in order for your approval. In order authorizing the City of Boston to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority statement of interest for its accelerated repair program for the following schools. Warren Prescott, Haley Pilot School, Curley K through eight school lower building, Henderson K through 12 Inclusion School Upper Campus, Orenberger School and the English High School. The statements of interest describe and explain the deficiencies and the priority category for each of the City of Boston, which the City of Boston may be invited to apply for the MSBA Accelerated Repair Grant Program in the future. Thank you. Docket 0346 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0347. Docket number 0347, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $266,500, sorry, $266,500 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 22 local cultural council program awarded by the Massachusetts Cultural Council to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. The grant will fund innovation arts, humanities, interpretive sciences programming that enhance the quality of life in our city. Thank you, docket 0347 will be referred to the Committee on Arts, Culture, Special Events. Mr. Clark, please read docket 0348. Docket number 0348, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $237,500 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 22 has met earmark awarded by the Massachusetts Department of Fire Services to be administered by the fire department. The grant will fund decontamination equipment, vehicle and maintenance expenses for the hazard response team at the Boston Fire Department. Thank you. Docket 0348 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0349. Docket number 0349, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $150,000 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year COVID-19 SADV Trust Fund awarded by the Department of Public Health to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund two full-time domestic violence advocates who will work with social service agency partners at the Boston Public Health Commission Family Justice Center. Thank you, docket 0349 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety Criminal Justice. Mr. Clark, please read docket 0350. Docket number 0350, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $40,500 in the form of a grant for the Adopt a Statue Endowment Fund awarded by the Boston Foundation to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. 
the grant will fund the care and maintenance of the John Boyle O'Reilly sculpture by Daniel Chester French. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, the chair recognizes Councillor Edwards, chair of the Committee on Arts, Culture, Special Events. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, due to the amount of the money and the fact that this is not a controversial fund, it is simply to preserve fund uh, statutes and to allow for us to make sure that we have the care and stewardship of public monuments. I am moving to suspend and pass for this $40,000 to be immediately put to good use. I know my colleague, Councilor Bach, has some brief remarks to make about the statute as it is in her district, but I would encourage my colleagues not to belabor this, nor do we really need a long hearing about $40,000 to help preserve and maintain a statute. So I, I am I'm moving to suspend and pass. Thank, thank you, Council Edwards. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, President Flynn. And I just briefly wanted to note on this statue um, since we've got St. Patrick's Day coming up, uh, John Boyle O'Reilly was a really amazing figure in Boston. He grew up in Ireland. Um, he was actually imprisoned by the British for being part of the Fenian Brotherhood and pushing for Irish home rule and independence. He was ultimately shipped off to Australia um, as part of the, uh, 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 you know, the shipping of prisoners to Australia. He made a daring escape from the Australian penal colony on a new Bedford whaler ship, came to the U.S. Um, We've been talking a lot lately about how Boston is a city of immigrants and the country is a country of immigrants. And I think it uh, really underscores that when O'Reilly showed up in the US the day that he landed, he was naturalized as an American citizen, something which doesn't happen these days. And he then moved to Boston and ended up becoming an incredibly celebrated and beloved man of letters here in the city. He was the editor of The Pilot, which was this big Catholic um, publication, uh, and he was also just a really well-known poet um, throughout the country. Uh, and so when he died, um, and, oh, and I should also say, really importantly, he ended up being a real bridge cultural figure between the like the sort of Protestant establishment in Boston and the growing Catholic immigrant community. He was kind of beloved by all, and so when he died in 1890, um, it was really like all factions of the city that came together to create this subscription fund. The statue was actually paid for by just individuals in the public signing up, uh, thousands and thousands of them from all over the world actually to fund this $20,000 statue. Um, and, uh, but the city council actually appropriated the money for these memorial books to be printed by the city printing office. Um, so when I was doing the history reading about this, I, I laughed because it, well, it's the municipal printing office that printed this and they were paid for out of the City Council's Incidental Expenses Fund, a thing which doesn't exist these days, um, but you know, just a flag. Um, and so, you know, rather than having this just be like words on a piece of paper on the agenda, I wanted to underscore um, that he was just a really important person in the cultural life of the city uh, 150 years ago, and also um, that I think it, it shows you that the stories of how immigrants become completely essential and embedded in the fabric of Boston um, is a story that we can we can and should tell again and again and, and that we should memorialize again and again So grateful to um, Councillors for supporting Councillor Edwards's motion for suspension and passage today And the statue is in Fenway it is um, it's facing if you if you're coming on Boylston Street from the back bay Like to cross the fence. It's immediately on your left across from the Massachusetts Historical Society building if you know it There's kind of like some seating around it um, and uh, you know, I have a whole two-page poem by O'Reilly, but uh, Lydia said I go on too long, so you're not going to get it today. But it was, you know, he he was uh, the favorite poet of many Boston St. Patrick's Days for many years. So, uh, thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Council Bach, and in, and in South Boston on Dorchester Street, we have the John Boyle O'Reilly apartment buildings as well. So, just wanted to give you a little bit more trivia. Um, Councillor Edward moves for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0350. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0351? Docket number 0351, message in order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $36,250 in the form of a grant for the dialogue to action awarded by the Boston Redevelopment Authority to be administered by the Office of Resiliency and Racial Equity. The grant will fund pro pro programmatic activities to deepen participants' 
understanding of racism in historical and present day forms and foster a sense of agency to change the system through actions at individual, interpersonal, or systemic levels. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Docket 0351 will be referred to the Committee on Civil Rights and Immigrant Advancement. Mr. Clark, can you please read docket 0352? Docket number 0352, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $28,000.13 in the form of a grant for, for the fiscal year 21 Violence Against Women Act Stop Grant awarded by the United States Department of Justice passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund a civilian domestic violence advocate who provides services for victims in Jamaica Plain, East Boston, and Charlestown. Thank you. Docket 0352 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Mr. Clerk, can you please read Docket 0353 and 0354 together. Document number 0353, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Guali Valdez as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for a term expiring January 15, 2025. And document number 0354, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Philomene Laptiste as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for a term expiring January 15, 2025. Thank you. Docket 0353 and 0354 will be assigned to the Committee on Public Health, Homelessness, Recovery. Reports of public officers and others. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0355 and 0356 together. Document number 0355, notice was received from the city clerk in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 regarding action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of February 9th, 2022. Document number 0356, communication was received from Nicholas Arenello, assessing commissioner of the appointment of Walter Hyde to a position in the commercial unit in the assessing department. Docket 0355, 0356 will be placed on file. Matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0259. Docket number 0259, an ordinance amending City of Boston Code Ordinances Chapter 15, Section 10, and establishing the Boston Fair Chance Act. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, yesterday, March 8th, the Government Operations Committee held a hearing on docket number 259, an ordinance amending the City of Boston Code, ordinances in Chapter 15, <coughs> Section 10, that establishes the Boston Fair Chance Act. This docket is sponsored by Councilor Mejia and myself. The ordinance would amend existing language in the Boston City Code, establishing a Chief Affirmative Action Officer instead of, instead, creating the Boston Fair Chance Act. The Fair Chance Act would formalize the position of the Chief Diversity Officer, who would provide oversight of the city's non-discrimination, equal opportunity, and affirmative action policies. This ordinance would also require regular updates on progress made regarding diverse hiring. Uh, would, hold on one second, just make sure I'm where I am. Uh, and promotions and require that the Chief Diversity Officer work with offices to make sure there are fair hiring practices and policies in place for family members of current employees. I want to thank my co-sponsor, Councilor Mejia, for introducing this legislation, as well as my council colleagues for joining, uh, Council President Ed Flynn, Councilor Rusi louis Jen, uh, Councilor Aaron Murphy, Councilor Kenzie Bach, Councilor Kendra Lara, Councilor Liz Braden, and Councilor Brian Worrell. I also want to thank members of the administration for their attendance and participation, and I finally want to thank the advocates who took the time out of their work days uh, and showed tremendous courage in their testimony yesterday uh, and sharing their experiences. I'm looking forward to getting to work on the specific language in this ordinance, and as chair, I recommend that this docket remain in committee uh, so that we can have some working sessions on it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Mr. President, um, and thank you to my co-sponsor, Councilor Arroyo, for, share, uh, for chairing a great hearing. And I just wanna take a quick moment to thank all the panelists and members of the public who took a big risk showing up yet at yesterday's hearing and speaking up about the injustices that they face here every day. We have heard from so many other people who have experienced the same workplace problems but are too afraid to speak up because they fear retaliation. But let's be clear, it should not be a punishable offense for any employee to try to make a workplace better and friendlier to people from all backgrounds. That is, in fact, actual, um, exactly what our ordinance is designed to do. We are incredibly grateful to receive um, testimony from Shigun Uduru, um, Mary, Ang Mary Ageneli Solis Severa from the Mayor's Administration, in addition to our panel of advocates, Dennis Bunyan, um, Daryl Higginbottom, Jerome Hargold, and Jeff, um, Dr. Jeff Lopes. Um, we've learned a lot about their personal and professional experiences dealing with workplace <coughs> discrimination, and I look forward to continuing al uh, working alongside each of these amazing advocates as we move towards working um, in our working sessions and eventually towards passing this ordinance. Finally, I'd like to, take, um, to thank Jasmine from Councilor Arroyo's um, staff for helping us prepare all of this hearing um, and, and moving this work forward. You know, and I just wanna quickly say that, you know, over the last year or so, we have heard from so many people um, who were afraid to even meet with me in public because they didn't wanna talk about this. Um, and so it took a lot of courage for people to step up and, and share their personal journeys, but I think this is a call to action. If, is, if we're really serious about really looking at the systemic racism that exists um, and continues to prevent black and brown people from moving up, then we need to make sure that we're leaning into this conversation and ready to roll up our sleeves um, to do right. Um, by so many employees who have been passed up for promotions that they were well qualified for and oftentimes are training their white counterparts to do the work that they should be doing. So I'm hoping that um, as we continue to uh, move forward with the working sessions that we come ready to do the work that it's gonna take to bring justice to the folks who have been waiting for far too long. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Mejia. Thank, thank you, Council Royo. Docket 0259 will remain in committee. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0272 and 0273 together. Docket number 0272, message in order for your approval in order to reduce the fiscal year 22 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $2,016,409 to provide funding for various departments for fiscal year 22 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and CENA. Docket number 0273, message in orders for a supplemental appropriation order for various departments for fiscal year 22 in the amount of $2,016,409 to cover the fiscal year 22 cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and CENA. The terms of the contracts are October 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2023. The major provisions of the contracts include base wage increases of 2%, 1.5%, and 2% to be given in October of each fiscal year of the contract term, filed in the office of the city clerk on February 14, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach, chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation, Technology. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and I note for colleagues that you have a committee report um, late filed with you. Uh, we had a productive hearing yesterday here in the chamber. Thank you uh, so much to Council President Flynn and also Councillor Murphy for joining me um, and to Councillor Louis Jen for sending a thoughtful letter. Um, we were joined by Chief Financial Officer and Collector Treasurer um, for the City, Justin Starrett, Budget Director Jim Williamson, and our Director of Labor Relations, Tammy Pust. Um, they were here to testify on behalf of the administration. Um, and I also want to thank Central Staff um, for uh, getting us back into, uh, this is now the second one of these hybrid um, hearings where we've, we've got all the mechanics of the in-person hearing and also the mechanics of the hybrid hearing. So shout out as ever to the folks behind the scenes making that happen, um, especially in this case, Michelle and Carrie. Um, docket 0272 transfers funds um, from the collective bargaining reserve to various departments 
and 273 authorizes the funding of the collective bargaining agreement um, between the city of Boston and Senna, which stands for the salaried employees of North America. Um, as was recited uh, in the docket by the clerk, we've reached an agreement from October 1, 2020 to September 30th, 2023. Um, it's, you know, for further background, um, for those who weren't able to make the hearing, um, as I think many people know, basically all of our bargaining units um, are out of contract right now, and uh, Senna is one of the many that lapsed sort of a year and a half ago. Um, and so the way that the city handles that financially is it sets a certain amount of money aside in this collective bargaining reserve, just sort of anticipating that we'll spend it once deals are reached, and that's what this appropriation today is, is doing. It's taking $2 million out of that $10 million reserve because a deal's been reached. Um, that's to cover the amount of the deal that runs up through the 30th of June this year. Everything that's part of this a contract that the city's obligated to after July 1st will be reflected in the proposed budget. So this is just for the balance of the contract period that's sort of already happened. Um, and uh, yeah, and so the main provisions of the contract are, the, of the MOA changes are that Juneteenth has been added um, for these employees as a holiday um, and that there are uh, increases, incremental increases to um, salaries across the board, 2% for the first year, 1.5 for the second, and 2% for the third. Um, and this, for it to even get to us, it's already been ratified um, by the union um, and agreed at the table by both sides. And uh, we heard good testimony about how it's sort of a balance between making sure that we're treating our city workers well and also that everything is within sort of the fiscally responsible remit of the city, especially since we have to balance so many of these. So with that, um, uh, Mr. President, I would recommend that these two dockets, 0272 and 0273, as read by the clerk, um, pass today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Bob. We will now take these votes separately. Council, Con Council Bach, the Chair on the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology, seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of Docket 0272. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0272 has passed. Councilor Bach, the Chair on the Committee of, on City Services, Innovation Technology, seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of Docket 0273. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0273 has passed. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Mr. Quirk, please read docket 0357. Docket number 0357, Councillor Fernandez Anderson offered the following. Order for a hearing to explore a rent-to-own pilot program. The chair recognizes Councillor Anderson. Councillor Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you everyone here who participated. Before I uh, begin, I just would like to start in proper um, saying uh, in my spiritual practice, uh, we say, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajeem. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa alhamdulillah wa Allahu Akbar. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most gracious. I'd like to begin by thanking the people who without their support, I wouldn't be here today. First, thank you to my children, Louis and Shakir. Louis, who too has chosen the path of service, becoming a United States Marine, yet still found the time to serve my campaign. And Shakir, my accomplished young artist, who canvassed blocks and kept me company on those extra long weekends. They have begun they have given me unlimited love and purpose and have granted me immense grace and patience as I've taken this journey. I'd like to thank my loving husband, Tanzirius Swatch Anderson, who is to be blamed for my striding about as though I, I bear the weight of a queen's crown. I want to thank my team. <laughs> Our dear D7, Chief of Staff, Joshua McFadden. Our Director of Budget and Operations, Amina Scott, 
uh, Director of Communications and Commu Community Relations, Kalamu Kieta. And finally, and certainly but not least, the woman who holds D7 Constituent Service down, our Director of Constituent Service, my loving sister, Aline Mercury. I'd like to thank my Carvalho family who had my back through and through. I'd like to thank my campaign team for believing in me and our mission. Thank you, Mohammed Missouri, Calvin Feliciano, Noah Coolidge, Jaquetta Vincent, Steve McKenna, Rich Thuma, Patrick Keeney, Italo Fini. I'm grateful to Chief Brianna Malore for pushing me and convincing me to run for office. To my ace, Delita Rasha, a big shout out to all my friends and supporters who came out today. My cousin, Rita Fernandez. A shout out to my friend, Aziza Robinson, Joa DePina, Kristen Halbert, Tiffany Calgal, Lois Eliza, thank you so much for your advocacy and support. And of course, Tony Brewer. I'd like to thank my friend, Professor Lily Song, my spiritual brother, Saeed Abdul Karim, my auntie, Senator Diane Wilkerson, Representative Liz Miranda, my colleagues, and all those who endorsed my campaign. Thank you to everyone who donated financially, who donated their time and their spirit to our campaign. And thank you to all the union reps and members. A special shout out to all the amazing youth canvassers, all 25 of them. My friends and my artist community, of course, a huge thank you to each and every single District 7 voter, those who voted for me and rocked with me from day one, and those who didn't vote for me, thank you for doing your part. To my dear, loving mentor, Fadila Muhammad. who's always believed in me. Thank you for the time. You invested in me and my, and my development with great patience and love. To my beloved Uncle Lewis, although he is no longer with us, left me with a rich legacy of immeasurable strength and compassion. As a gay black man during the 80s, he was confronted with an unkind world. But he never flinched, and he fortified himself with love and honor, sacrificing his own happiness to ensure my future could be one day realized. He taught me everything about living with truth and justice and kindness, and I look forward to making him proud serving this community. Bear with me, y'all. <laughs> you know, when I was a little girl in the small West African country of Cape Verde, I never could have imagined I'd be here today talking to you. This is definitely a long way from former colonized trans transatlantic slave trade port to the heart of American democracy. But for my entire life, I have always been a dreamer and a fighter. And looking back, many of those dreams came to me as a child walking barefoot on her way to the market carrying more than the responsibility of safely returning home with a loaf of bread to feed my entire family of 17 under one single roof. On those walks, I also carried with me dreams of a better life, of a life that was more than just surviving, but those dreams were limited by oppressive poverty because survival doesn't make room for much else but a mother's precipitated heartbeat in a motionless ocean a brother's illusions of adaptability, or a son stomps to drum beats for mercy. I never forget, I'll never forget the day my uncle Luis boarded me on that plane. Don't forget your brothers and sister, he pleaded. At the age of 10, I was in Boston Logan International Airport, afraid that the escalator would swallow me up, anxiously skimming my big brown eyes, hoping to recognize my mother after six long years. A woman tapped me on my shoulders and gently asked, do you remember me? I rushed into her arms with tears of joy, fear of unrequited love and guilt of being chosen for this moment over the siblings I left behind. 
Boston is a beautiful place, full of diversity, with world-class education and first-class jobs. But we also know those opportunities aren't fairly distributed or made available to everyone, undocumented, black, and female, I was made afraid of both law enforcement and gangs. It was a scary place, and finding success meant finding safe spaces, finding supports, systems that would nurture my potential and protect me from worse undercurrents of poverty, violence, and political apartheid. I owe much of the, my neighborhood where I found moms and aunties who embraced me and taught me what it meant to be a strong black woman living in America, navigating the perils of Boston. And although I was able to find that success due to no fault of their own, and despite their best efforts, countless others did not. And unfortunately, I see many of those same obstacles and barriers still with us today. During my campaign, I'd get invited to church or attend Friday Juma at mosques, and I'd see Boston. I see Boston everywhere, because Boston is in my heart. And now, when the world looks at Boston City Hall, full of color and representation, suits and hijabs, male and female, they'll see Boston too. The beauty and potential of humanity is all around us. And it's time we tap into the power to make Boston the hub of innovation, the standard of inclusion, and the pinnacle of equitable and fair economic opportunity, a place where no one is left behind. Our Boston should weave camaraderie in the fabric of our Constitution where our white brothers and sisters, our Asian, Atlantics, brown, and LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters will merge in the struggle to evolve as one people a place where there doesn't have to be just one successful black woman in this district, in this city, or in Congress, or in Senate, that we should look forward to a future where many successful black men thrive here and are allowed to flourish in their blackness or in their culture. That they are not expected to be a black person with only Anglo traditions. That we celebrate history, our truths, our knowledge, our skills, instead of embracing them to fit in. We have to hold Boston to the ideals of this country, that everyone has the right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Black and brown Bostonians will never be able to achieve this as long as the shackles of slavery still exist with us 400 years later. If Boston can't within themselves change so that marginalized Bostonians have a better life there's no hope for people anywhere else in this country. As a matter of fact, we are all interconnected. Those with privilege have to open up their pockets and their hearts for progress to happen. If Boston is going to teach its full potential, reach its full potential, we have to act morally responsible in how we treat our own citizens. I'm talking about inconveniencing our kids and sending them to a culture of microaggression by busing them to rich suburban schools, forcing them to have dual lives. We have to ask ourselves, why is it necessary in 2022 to pay schools to take our children to get equality? Why in, is Boston incapable of doing this ourselves? I'm talking about a medical establishment that sends black mothers home to die because they consistently believe that black mothers can endure more pain. I'm talking about the displacement of our ethnic markets for supermarkets that don't fit our neighborhoods or budget. I'm talking about how they use mass incarceration to commoditize our black bodies, robbing us of our fathers, our sons, our husbands. I'm talking about systemically racist, bureaucratic delay tactics that keep us unhoused, allowing seaport luxury developers to avoid housing black and brown people. 1989, Academy Homes, where gun violence was at its peak, 
but it was my home. Project Heat would dry my skin up, but this was my home. With little to eat, neighbors shared meals where we dealt with our quarrels, but no one dared to call Popo. Where Ms. Elba told us stories about the old days in Puerto Rico, we'd get interrupted by drive-bys. Where food stamps were sold alongside stolen brand na named fashion. Where the little girls and the old ladies took turns in seat to get their hair braided. Where the corner store allowed layaways where the boys rapped on summer stages with dreams to become stars, where friends got killed and where police beat us, where mothers died from crack, where the government left us to die. This is what we call home. Imagine a city where, after all of those experiences, you are afforded the opportunity to own your own home. This is why, as one of my first official duties, I chose to file an order for a hearing to explore a rent-to-own pilot program as one, of, as one way to creating solutions to break the chains that bind us in cycles of oppression and poverty, as one way our city can redeem ourselves. Home is where you are nurtured. Home is where you learn to walk, to read, and it should feel safe at night. Home is the place you belong. Home is where your family unit is solidified and where your tribe heals. Home is where you are loved and nourished. Home is our sanctity. Our home is also our greatest source of wealth. So it's no surprise that Boston, the average area medium wealth for black families is just $8. Redlining discriminatory lending practices and predatory loans have robbed the American dream from countless black and brown Bostonians. When we talk about solving the housing crisis, it's not enough to just produce apartments to rent. We must help people to find a home. Our Boston should be the proving ground for the democratic experiment, where no matter where you begin, you have the opportunity to life of justice and liberty according to your own merit and determination. Some will say, we are asking for too much, that we're dreaming too big. They will construct new barriers and trash our names. They will try to stop us, tell us to slow down. And when they, think, when they can't think of anything else, they'll resort to old political tricks of obstruction. They'll say that there isn't enough money while lining their pockets of special interest and their cronies. But we won't stop. We won't give in, and we won't lose. We may not win every battle, but we will win the war of, for a more just and equitable Boston. Don't believe those who say that we, it can't be done. I am living proof that impossible means nothing, that there is nothing we can't do. We are proof that the power of people is stronger than the power of politics. We can, and we will. Thank you for trusting me with this mission. With God's will and your support, I won't let you down. Please, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, at this time, I, 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 excuse me, excuse me.
done and thank you for your resiliency and your commitment to the art district and to the residents of the of the city. At this time, I would like to ask if anyone would like to speak on this matter. At this time, I'd like to ask if anyone would like to add. At, at this time, I'd like to ask if anyone. Yeah. At this time, we're going to take a five minute recess.
The council is back in session. Thank you. We are back in session. Um, going back to 0357, with that hearing order, wanted to see if anyone wants to speak and or um, add your name. Let me, let me go, let me call on Council Baker. Council Baker. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to congratulate the, um, my sister from District 7. You were amazing, you are a superstar, and, and all the things that we should strive for, you talked about, you laid it out for us. You should be proud of yourself. Your family should be proud of you, and you know, hopefully we'll see good work out of you, and please sign my name onto that. I love your idea. This, hopefully we're gonna be able to hash something out to, to put people on a path to um, housing. My mother always said to me, she came here as an immigrant, fifth grade education. My oldest brother was blind. She knew the most important thing was housing and stability. You need that familiar surrounding. You need a roof over your head. You need to be fed, so thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. <laughs> Please add Council Baker's name. Would anyone else like to speak or um, add their name? Let me call on Councilor uh, Lujan would, um, uh, to speak at this time. <clears throat> or, or to add your name. Uh, I just want to say um, congratulations to uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson for handling everything always with so much grace, for your fearlessness, for your maiden speech, for being a powerful black woman that has added to this voice here at Boston City Council. You are going to do so right by. You're going to do uh, so much good for your constituents, and I'm happy to have you as a colleague here um, and excited for, for your leadership and your work. So thank you, obrigada, for everything you bring to the table. Thank you, Councilor. Um, Councilor Mejia? Okay. Um, the Chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, uh, Councilor Fernandez-Anderson, for running, for being who you are, for your courage, the way you speak, truth to power, and don't get shy about saying truths that are so very necessary to be said but often get danced around. Uh, I'm grateful to you for using your first speech to do that. I look forward to the work you do. This is a perfect example of taking something that is practical, doable, should have been done, should be something we do, and putting it on the table so we move it forward. I look forward to what you do. Uh, I'm a fan. And so thank you. Add my name. Uh, and I'm just grateful to you for how you did this. And I hope that you, you take this day in uh, for the way it has been and the way it will be uh, as a start to the work that you are doing. So I look forward to it. Uh, I can't wait to see you hit that button more often. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Royal. Please add Council Royal's name. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Yes. I am so happy that I was here for all of this. I am so incredibly like in awe like literally, when you talk about you're gonna keep it 100, you're gonna bring that fire into this council, you're gonna join me and Councilor Baker on the who's got the most swag up in here. I am so <laughs> excited about the energy that you bring. No, that, that's a compliment, Baker, you know, you and I. Um, but, but no, seriously, I'm so incredibly encouraged by just the, the, the level of enthusiasm that you bring into this work, how honest you are about the realities that so many people are experiencing and oftentimes are too afraid to say it. And you do so with so much conviction, right? And you might be little, but you got that big old mouth, girl, and everybody's here for it. Um, but no, seriously, thank you so much for just coming in um, holding it down, being the fierce Capricorn that you are, for all the late night conversations that we've had, for what I know is going to be a long sisterhood journey outside of this council. I'm just so incredibly grateful to be able to share this space with you and cause the type of disruption that we know this moment calls for. So I'm here for all of it and congratulations on a beautiful speech. Um, you brought us back and forth on an emotional roller coaster, and that every single word that you put together really inspired people to recognize not only who you are, but why you do what you do with so much love and passion for this work. 
So thank you, Counselor Tanya Fernandez Anderson, for your leadership. Please sign me on on all things Tanya every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Please add Council Mejia's name. The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Hermana, congratulations. Um, I am incredibly excited and I'm incredibly grateful not only for your partnership and the work that we're going to do here on the City Council, but for your friendship outside of here. I think that if the way that you show up for me is any indication of how you're going to show up for District 7, they are in good hands. Uh, I'm excited. Um, please sign my name on to this. I'm excited to work on, on this with you and all of the other things that we're going to work on on the City Council. Uh, you are a shining example of what it <coughs> means to be a bridge builder without letting go of any of your beliefs and standing strong in your values while also reaching across uh, to work with other people. So I think that uh, the people of District 7 did a great job. <laughs> they picked the right one. And I'm really excited to, you know, I know that we, we share a, a precinct in <laughs> Roxbury and, and District 6 share a very small precinct together. So I'm excited to uh, work together, uh, not just for the betterment of our districts, but for the betterment of all black and brown people here in the city. So se te quiere mucho, congratulations. Council Lara, add, we're going to add your name too? Yes, please. Please add Council Lara's name. Um, please add Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Worrell. Please add the chair. And docket 0357 will be referred to the Committee on Housing and Community <coughs> Development. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0357. 5A, please. Docket number 0358, Councilor Mejia offered the following. A resolution recognizing March 13, 2022 as Essential Workers' Day in the City of Boston. Thank you. The, ch the Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, I've said it before, but this, uh, this job is not the first time in my life that I've had to work um, more than one job just to get by. I've always had to juggle two or three just to make my ends meet. And I spent a lot of time in my youth working to help my mom cleaning offices, selling shoes, working at McDonald's, everything and anything just to make extra money for our family. Growing up, I didn't know what an essential worker was, even if I was one myself. I certainly wasn't made to feel like I was essential. In fact, I was constantly reminded of how replaceable I was because of people making 10 times my salary described what I was doing as low-skilled labor. And that is why we need days like essential workers here in the city of Boston. As a city council, we need to stand up and affirm that people who clean our buildings, bag our groceries, serve us our coffee, are the most valuable workers we have here in the city. More importantly, we need to take Essential Workers Day as an opportunity to ask ourselves, what are we doing to not just thank essential workers, but what um, systems changes that we need to make to improve the lives of our essential workers? That means increasing wages, reducing barriers to affordable housing, and supporting unions whenever possible. This Essential Workers Day is our office working to recognize over 250 workers across the city for their efforts during COVID and despite those challenges that the pandemic has brought us. We partnered with SCIU 509, the Greater Boston Labor Council, uh, one, uh, Local 103, MAMLIO, and EMS. And we want to make sure that we don't just have a day to recognize our essential workers, but that we celebrate their work every day. This is our moment to step up and support our essential workers as much as they supported us during COVID. I move that we suspend and pass the rules and pass this resolution, and I invite you all to celebrate us alongside us on March the 13th. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name as a co-sponsor? Please add Councilor Arroyo, Baker, Bach, Braden, Edwards, Fernandez-Anderson, Lara, Lujan, 
Mejia, Murphy, Worrell, and add the chair as well. Docket, docket 0358, oh, Council Mejia is seeking suspension of the rules in adoption of 0358. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0358 has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0359. Docket number 0359, Councilor Mejia offered the following. A resolution recognizing March as National Social Worker Month. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Don't worry, y'all, this is the last time, okay? <laughs> I don't have any more to file for today. Um, but anyways, thank you, Mr. President. And in the spirit of uplifting our essential workers, I also want to note that March is National Social Workers Month. I've been working alongside social workers my entire life, both as colleagues and also as a recipient of many of their services. And I'm sure you all know a social worker um, is neither glamorous nor profitable, um, but our social work is more than just a job, it's a calling. I've known social workers to take calls in the middle of the night, take time away from their families, and risk their own health and safety to provide services to people in need. For many, social work is not just what you do, it's who you are. New social workers are predominantly women, actually 90%, and are diverse in terms of race and ethnicity. More than 22% of new social workers are black, African American, and 14 Hispanic Latino, according to the National Council of Social Work Education. But it won't be surprising that despite being an industry with a large portion of women, gender gaps still exist. 89% of the low wage social work force are women, struggling to get by in an industry where people are already overworked and underpaid. So as we move to celebrate National Social Workers Month, let us use this opportunity to not just celebrate the social workers in your life, but to find ways to improving their working conditions and award them with their selfless work every day. I move to suspend and pass this resolution and for us to celebrate our social workers. Thank you, Council Mejia. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank you, Julia. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Counselor um, Mejia. Um, as a social, as a, someone who's worked 27 years, invested 27 years in public health, um, I strongly support this. I think that so social workers are strongly unrecognized or um, uh, not valued. And um, I remember working with uh, my friend here, uh, I think she's left, Taisha Horner from Age Strong. Um, and we, we basically worked there at Roxbury Multi-Service Center very early age. I was 13, I started working, and this was a time that I had to save money to bring, to help my mom bring my brother and sister from Cape Verde. And Taisha Horner and myself got into this field because they did a peer education but remembering the patience of the late Barbara Bullett at Roxbury Multi-Service Center, Ms. Claudia, who's still around, um, and all of these people who mentor you in the community, who do this work with their heart and their spirit and their mind without, and they don't get paid enough, right? So I strongly support it. I thank you so much for bringing it to our attention and um, look forward to doing more about that if you, if you shall uh, file. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. You'd like to add your name as well? Yes, please. Please add Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Um, anyone else like to um, add their name? Please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Lara, Councilor Eugene, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Worrell, and please add the chair. Councilor Mejia seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of 0359. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0359 has been adopted. We're going on to personnel orders. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0360. 
Docket number 0360, Councillor Flynn for Councillor Murphy. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0360. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0361. Docket number 0361, Councillor Flynn for Councillor Murphy. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0361. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0362. Docket number 0362, Councillor Flynn for Councillor Brayton. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0362. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. Late files. We're now moving on to late files. I am informed by the clerk that there are, there is one late file matter. The late, the late file matter is a letter of absence from City Council of Flaherty. Mr. Clerk, if you can read that letter into the record, please. A letter from City Councilor Mike Flaherty. Dear Council, of, Council President Flynn, I write today to inform you and my colleagues that I am unable to attend today's council meeting due to a family commitment. I want to express my support for docket number 0273, a supplemental appropriation order for various departments to cover the fiscal year 22 cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and CENA. My staff will be in attendance today and I will thoroughly review the meeting recording in minutes. Should you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact my office. Thank you. Michael Flaherty, Boston City Councilor at Large. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Welcome. That will be placed on file. We're, we're going on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. Seeing none, we're moving on to the consent agenda. I have been informed by the clerk that there are no additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. Announcements. Does anyone have any announcements at this time? The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So since Russia invaded the Ukraine on February 24th, there have been more than 400 Ukrainian civilians murdered, including 27 children, and over 1,000 injured. It is horrifying watching this war unfold on our television and on our phones in real time. I was proud to stand in solidarity with thousands of our Ukrainian neighbors at the rally hosted by the Ukrainian Cultural Center of New England this past weekend at the Common. It is estimated that 10,000 Ukrainians live in the Boston area, and they have been gathering in solidarity and showing support for each other. I was happy to join them, and I felt fortunate to meet Sasha, who was a young 18-year-old college student who left her family in the Ukraine just this past August to start college at MIT. As a mother, I could feel her pain and her fear and her guilt for her family that was back home. When I was um, able to speak to the crowd, I told them I would be wearing this new Ukrainian t-shirt that I bought from a fundraiser to show my solidarity and to show that we as a Boston City Council are here for our Ukrainian residents and also our Russian residents who may feel fear from any backlash of this war. I'm sending love and strength to Sasha and all of our Ukrainians here and I just wanted them to know that they're not alone. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Murphy. The chair recognizes Councilor Bork. Council Bork, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, President Flynn. I just wanted to take the moment and announcements um, to acknowledge some staff transitions in my office. Um, Lauren Brody uh, has been my chief of staff since I began on the council. Um, I actually met her when I was knocking doors in the back bay, um, and uh, she asked me about where I was on anti-poverty programs, and it turned out that she worked for ABCD, um, and we got to talking, and uh, then when I won the seat, I asked her to come in, um, and she did an incredible job for me over the last two years as a chief of staff, um, managing what, I think in each office, our chief of staffs have managed, which is the transition from fully in person to fully remote and then back to um, all the different constellations that our offices, like so many others, have taken. Um, and Lawrence has been fantastic uh, and, also, um, and also just a wonderful liaison to the Back Bay, um, looking at lots of uh, 
all district matters, how we make sure that the cannabis industry rolls out equitably in our neck of the woods. Um, and uh, yeah, I've just been really, really grateful to her. Um, so uh, she, her last day was the week that we didn't have a council meeting. So I wanted to um, just take a moment to acknowledge um, her. I think it's always good for us to recognize the staff behind the scenes who make our offices what they are. Um, and I also wanted to um, acknowledge that with that transition, uh, Emily Brown in my office uh, will be stepping up into the chief of staff role. Um, you probably already know Emily because she's everywhere and, um, and uh, tracks everything and um, has been doing unbelievable policy and budget work uh, for me for the last two years. And so, um, and before that was also like a neighborhood liaison, so she knows the whole office. And uh, I'm just really excited to have her stepping up into that role. And, uh, and Kennedy Avery and Anthony Baez on my office are also both taking on um, new responsibilities as we reconfigure. So just want to shout out my whole staff team. Um, I feel like sometimes you can watch these meetings and think it's just 13 of us, but we know better. So thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Bach. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, thank you, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just want to make a note for, for people. Uh, the Pioneer Institute came out with a report today um, recommending, um, um, I can't think of the word. Receivership. receivership, thank you. Receivership for the schools. There was a, a story in the Herald yesterday and I think the, Glo the Globe the day before. I know we have a, an order for a hearing on it. So, you know, I, I think we should fully know and understand what receivership means. Um, so just to put it on people's radar. Thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. Any further announcements from anybody? We're going on to memorials. Um, today we, we will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. For council is Baker, Flaherty and Flynn, Leo, Mahon Leo Mahoney. For council is Flynn and Flaherty, Edwin Bud Waite. For council Fernandez Anderson, Fadilla Muhammad, Luis Manuel Ferrer Suarez D. Carvello, Ashley Nicole Bazell. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of those mentioned individuals. And we are scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber on Wednesday, March 16th at 12 noon. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. aye. The council is adjourned.